Welcome to Raising the Bar, Supporting Teaching Renewal in Business Education Edition, a webinar produced in collaboration with Dr. Tanya Means, Assistant Dean, Assistant Professor of Practice and Management, and Director of teaching, the Teaching and Learning Center at the College of Business at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and featuring Dr. Angela Palladino, Director of the Williams Center of Learning, Advancement, and Professor of Marketing at the University of Melbourne. I'm Steve Dandenau, the Executive Director of the Reinvention Collaborative, and on behalf of the RC's Research University members, I want to thank Dr. Means for helping to organize this session and for moderating it, and Dr. Palandino and her University of Melbourne colleagues for kindly sharing of their expertise and their experience. Tanya, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Steve. And I am really excited to bring um, Angela Palladino here into this conversation. I had a great conversation with Steve and his group a while back, and it was such a good experience. I wanted to share it with some of my colleagues. So Angela is a very good friend of mine, and um, we've enjoyed working together over the years. And I will quickly read to you a little bit of her bio, and then I'll turn it over to her to introduce her colleagues. So Angela Palladino is the director of the Williams Center of Learning Advancement and a professor of marketing at the University of Melbourne. She has taught undergraduate and postgraduate marketing for over 20 years in class sizes ranging from 85 to over 600 students. She's published her work in journals, including the Journal of Product Innovation Management, Personality and Social Psychology Review, a Journal of Marketing Education, Environmental Education Research, and the Journal of Business Ethics. Angela has been awarded over 12 international and national teaching awards from organizations, including the Academy of Marketing Science and the Australian government. She's been awarded almost $40 million uh, in competitive funding from national and international agencies, including the Australian Research Council. Angela is the former associate editor of the Journal of Product Innovation Management, and she's on the editorial review board of JPIM and the Journal of Marketing Education and Journal of Advancement in Marketing Education. Angela has a keen interest in research and business education with a focus on understanding how to engage students in teaching, the effects of feedback on student learning outcomes, and the effects of faculty peer review on teaching quality. Angela and I have worked pretty closely in um, a number of different activities and I've really enjoyed participating with her and look forward to this conversation. Angela, I'll turn it over to you and we'll listen to your presentation and then hopefully have some time for Q&A towards the end. Great, thank you very much, Tanya. And thank you, Steve, Tanya and, and Liz and Jenna for um, the invitation and the support to, to getting to today. Um, I will also be joined by my colleagues, um, Carsten, David and Maggie, who will give you a brief overview of their bio before each of their presentations later on. And in keen Twitter style, I should say that they're all of our Twitter identities. So if you'd like to note those down and tweet them, um, you're more than welcome to join in a Twitter conversation if you can multitask. So <laughs> I'll move on. Uh, so today what I'm going to do is really talk you through our COVID uh, journey which I was hoping when Steve originally um, emailed me about this would be uh, the break from COVID, but we're in wave number two. So uh, I'll also talk you through some of our preparations and how they changed as a result. So we really are becoming an agile university. So I'm going to talk through the environment, how um, we really planned or didn't plan uh, for the learning and transition in semester one. I'll review some of the lessons that we've learned, some of our faculty reflections, um, and I'm very uh, excited to then introduce and hand over to my three colleagues who will go through how they implemented innovation in this environment, in their three subjects, um, and then really talk you through how we're planning for really what is the continued unknown in this environment. And I'll hand over to Q&A as well. If I do go um, too long and talk too long, be, feel free to just stop my screen. Just some context for those who don't know much about the University of Melbourne. We're a large public institution, uh, so we can vary between 40 to 50,000 students. Uh, um, so the back that you see here is really the university webpage, and we're embedded within that. So the Williams Centre is a faculty centre based within the Faculty of Business and Economics. And we really work in collaboration with the faculty 
and the university's learning environments, which is the university's central support uh, for learning, all things learning. So Canvas support, all of those sort of things come from learning environments. So we really have a, a team approach in working uh, with everyone. And we have quite a small team. So most of the team is here with us today. Um, it's a great team to work with, I have to say. Real pleasure uh, to go to work every day, even though it's at home every day. But, um, but my colleagues really are fantastic and it makes it a real pleasure to work with them. So I'll talk through how they've also had a role in what we've done. So as um, I'm sure the experience would have been comparable in the US, uh, we really had a matter of days to transition our teaching from face to face to online. So I think the expectation was that COVID would pretty much stay in Asia like the other um, viruses had, and no one had expected a global pandemic to hit us. So we were all waiting with bated breath each day as to which day are we going to be asked to, to go home. So we had to really plan quickly to change what was a research or what is, I should say, a research intensive university. And we're really distinguished by face-to-face -face teaching uh, um, to move on to an online environment. Our teaching modes are also very different and our class sizes uh, can be quite complex and, and challenging. So we have lectures, tutorials, seminars and workshops. And our class sizes vary from some of the smallest classes um, that are really research PhD type classes of five students through to 2000 student um, sections. And what we then had as an added complexity was now our students were located across multiple time zones across the northern and southern hemisphere. So we had this extra challenge to deal with. And we know that um, we had a very uh, averse to online uh, faculty. So I don't think we would ever have seen this transition happen had it not been for, for COVID. So while the turbulent environment presented many, many challenges for us, um, it also opened up some great opportunities that uh, I don't think would have afforded us previously. Um, so we face a number of challenges on all fronts and because of that, we really had to work together. And for the first time we saw university faculty divisions really unifying uh, together to have all hands on deck. And this varied from not only the academics, but professional staff. And I can't say how proud I am to work at a university where you have no one really complaining, um, but everyone just scrambling to make sure that we're looking after the students and ensuring continuity of their education. What I'd like to do is really compare some of our challenges and um, what we felt in teaching with some of yours in the Northern Hemisphere. So I've put together a brief poll that I'm going to open up. Um, I'm going to put this in the chat box so you can just... So um, really what I'm after is where were your most significant challenges to teaching experience? So was it the transition to online? Was it the lecture theatre? Was it assessment? And you can answer twice. So your two top things. That's great. So some of the things that are emerging very similar across hemispheres. Online, I think that's a common theme. Maintaining engagement, so very much similar to um, what we've seen here. And you'll notice that um, in the shared family environment is still an ongoing issue here, how to interact um, becomes one of our largest themes that I'll talk about soon in maintaining engagement um, and teaching online, upskilling, another quick theme. So thank you. Uh, that's been great. I think I'll stop there. Um, but they're exactly the sort of themes that we're seeing um, really transfer from 
the northern and, and southern hemisphere. So the tertiary sector really has become a global sector. And what we're seeing is that the challenges we're all facing are the same regardless of institutions in terms of some of the main themes, um, unless you were, of course, an online university um, and didn't have to think about um, some of those issues. Okay, so hopefully, thank you for that. Hopefully you can see my slides again. Um, so learning from our transition, what we tried to do um, and what we tried to do a little differently was to ensure that we were committed to learning from our transition. Um, and what we wanted to do is collect information and data so we could have a data-driven approach to learning for semester two, as we knew this was going to be an ongoing issue. Um, so we collected three groups of data across semester one to really inform the faculty of A, what were our academics doing to transition online, and B, how would we gauge uh, feedback on, or we wanted to gauge feedback on students and staff on the learning experience. So this was something unique for the university and we wanted to make sure that we were assisting and supporting our staff as much as we could to assist that transition. So we sent a survey to, uh, to our staff in March and that was really helping to track um, what people were doing to, to do that rapid change. We then were given a mid-semester survey from Chancery and that was uh, issued to students to track their experiences online. And then we had a third call for data that the heads took charge of to track activities and challenges and how those uh, changes took place. And the data provided us with a fairly robust picture of where to focus our improvements um, and our extra support that we wanted to provide to staff as we transitioned um, and planned or tried to plan for semester two. So uh, what we did find were some really th large themes that came out, which was not uncommon with some of the universities as we were really just jumping to the online environment, was that academics had been predominantly involved in asynchronous modes of teaching. And what um, we did, what we found was that academics in the classroom uh, were much more engaging with their students. They engaged in an array of activities, but they didn't necessarily transfer that to the online mode. It, it, they almost became another personality, uh, but, and some others just blossomed in that environment. So they found the sequencing of teaching challenging, uh, um, and it really was consistent with the global experience with that rapid transition was needed. So remembering that the context we're working in is staff who have been predominantly face-to-face -face teaching with little to no training in the online environment and, and no need to previously, who have really, um, I would say, excelled um, to try and, and rapidly change their teaching in a matter of days. So as I mentioned, it really was a team effort for our first lot of data that we collected in late March. We had 65 subjects represented of postgraduate and undergraduate teaching. And what we found was that most people, as we expected, were engaging in ECHO 360 or lecture capture, um, asynchronous modes of teaching. So fewer academics were engaging in Zoom webinars, and I'll talk about how they use that later on. But we also used a variety of um, online activities to try and learn about how to best capture student engagement. So this is changing in semester two um, as more people have become confident with online and using different um, modes of technology. So asynchronous dominant, so workshops, seminars really captured and then just uh, recorded and played to students. Our tutorials are um, smaller classes that are delivered here. So we complement our large lectures for undergraduate teaching with tutorials. So the student gets a more um, closer experience and an applied experience in class. So even here, we found that much of the classes were happening. So were live Zoom lectures, as well as tutorial capture. What I should preface that with was that the tutorial captures were often happening um, at the same time as the live Zoom. So they were recording their live Zoom uh, um, class. Um, so you'll find much less diversity in the online tutorial mode compared to the lectures that we had a look at, but that was primarily because there was more synchronous teaching in this mode, less so in larger classes. We then tried to understand a little more about the engagement in lectures and seminars 
um, and really had a look at uh, how that was constructed. So Zoom featured much more. So Zoom tutorials and Zoom consultations you'll see in lectures and seminars, but we had much more diversity in terms of engagement tools with more people trialing things like discussion boards, um, Canvas chat, online games um, and simulations. So we then sought um, really to think about how academic development was happening. And we found that most people were coming to the Williams Centre for um, their primary uh, support. So our first uh, stop, uh, so to speak, for our academics. So they sought out materials and academics in the centre for help. And that was complemented really with discussions with colleagues. So they were the two main sources of support um, and colleagues featured uh, quite highly. The student mid-semester feedback um, was then provided by Chancery. So this gave us the student perspective of this experience and it very much reflected what our first data or collection of data showed us with much more students uh, um, agreeing that they would like to see more engagement and interaction with academics. And this was more pronounced uh, um, for our undergraduates uh, compared to our postgraduates where they obviously found that there was more engagement happening there. So two areas that we thought um, emerged as particularly important was this need to increase interactions between staff and students, but also among students that doesn't seem to be focused on as much in online or um, in face-to-face -face teaching where some of that work really happens automatically between the students, but we've now taken away that face-to-face -face element and it's something we haven't had to think about before as academics. So academic development becomes really important to try and enhance engagement um, in the classroom. So we then thought, uh, sought to receive a third piece of, piece of feedback um, that was solicited by the Williams Centre and really uh, directed by the heads of department. And we found that there were four areas that needed attention and they were tutorial attendance, weekly consults, tech issues, and the need for academics to engage in training. So I'm not going to read through all of these, but just speak to them briefly. Um, so again, the tutorial and seminar attendance and partici sorry, participation um, showed that this was an area that was our primary focus for improvement. So for semester two, as well as during the, the same semester. So we've had some mixed results. So some people had great success with breakout rooms and energetic student discussions. That was one extreme. And then on the other extreme, we had students not even turning on their cameras, muting their mics, totally disappearing um, and really making it a challenging environment for the tutors. So it helped us come up with different techniques and different ways um, to try and, and target some of these issues with our students. We also found the same sort of issues with discussion forums. So there were some that were very engaged with the discussion forum and some where there was a dominant sense of um, lack of presence and engagement from the students. So as you would expect, um, lots of areas for improvement, but also um, we have lots of areas for learning from our peers. So for all those excellent examples, we have a lot of sharing uh, that we could maximise. Um, weekly consultations were the primary mechanism. Remember when I looked at engagement, um, people were zooming into weekly consults. Uh, but again, we found that the take up rate of that was quite low for the lecturers, higher for the tutors, uh, who were seen as more approachable for many of the students. But some also commented um, that they took up more time uh, where they had to do more of these consults compared to when it was taken up in a face-to-face -face environment. Some commented on technical issues, others didn't. It didn't really feature as part of the other two data collection exercises, but uh, um, this lack of um, preparedness um, also really talked to the need for some academics to be more proactive in training and either formalised training or informal training just to be more ready for the different mechanisms that are available for teaching. And that led to the last comment where some, some academics really struggled on how to use Zoom and some of the uh, online tools, but some 
really excelled. So we, again, we had the two um, extremes, but within that, um, we really found that there was a big opportunity for learning um, among peers and among colleagues. So our four, so we communicated our five biggest challenges that we had to really leverage from was to balance asynchronous teaching with more synchronous learning opportunities. Our, and this is in order of importance for us um, to improve our student lecturer and student to student engagement with the latter not being looked at uh, in face to face teaching. So a lot of learning involved really to enhance the structure of LMS sites. Um, improve academic engagement and really to improve insight sharing. So I'll talk about those later. So we learned uh, in this process about some really innovative examples that were applied within disciplines and they were very, really valuable for us. Uh, Miriam, who's here with us today, um, who's our educational designer, really initiated and started off a good teaching series that's led to an online teaching series where we've helped to share some of these exemplars. Um, what's better than giving you an online um, exemplar website is to bring my colleagues in. So I'm very um, pleased to be able to bring in three of our colleagues, uh, first of which is Carson. Okay, so Carson Mirofsky is a decision scientist and professor in the Department of Finance, as well as co-director of the Brain, Mind and Markets Lab at the University. He's passionate about developing financial capabilities of people. He's one of the initiators of Street Finance, a really exciting program aimed at improving financial behavior and outcomes of young Victorians. And as part of the program, university students deliver lessons on basic financial knowledge in high schools around Melbourne. So prior to joining the University of Melbourne, Carsten was a postdoc fellow at the University of Zurich. He's been a visiting researcher at NYU and Columbia University in New York. He spent several years in the finance industry and he holds a, a PhD from the University of Zurich in Switzerland and a master's degree from the University of Beirut in Germany. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Carsten. Uh, thanks Carsten for your time this morning um, and I'm going to, would you like me to stop sharing and do you want to share your screen or do you want me to continue and flick over? Okay done. All right, well, uh, thank you, Angela, and um, thank you, Stephen and team, very much for the opportunity to share some uh, of our uh, teaching experiences and, and insights. And I, I do very much look forward to your questions uh, as we go. My um, little uh, talk will be about one of the experiential learning subjects we have in, you know, we, we offer in finance at, um, at the University of Melbourne. Um, a subject called street finance, um, which, by the way, I teach together with uh, one of Angela's colleagues at the Williams Center, Valerie Controne Bird, who is very integral and um, shares probably most of the credit for what I will talk about in my presentation <laughs> as, as we go. So I, I will just give you a little bit of background um, uh, about the subject uh, to better under for you to better understand some of the things that we did um, uh, in last last semester. Uh, during the COVID crisis. Now, so the, the background to this subject is, um, is really the following or a recognition that um, young people, and that includes uh, university students, but also teenagers, obviously, and perhaps even pre-teenagers, uh, are sort of increasingly exposed from a younger <clears throat> age to, to the financial systems. Uh, to the financial system in, in, uh, through all sorts of activities that they engage in. At the same time, financial decisions that we, have, we all have to make are becoming more and more complex and also um, more responsibility in, in terms of managing our finances is um, being passed you know, on to us, for example, in areas like retirement saving uh, and, and perhaps also insurance. Now in Australia, but I think that equally applies to countries like the US and others, we do, <clears throat> um, or we have been uh, recognizing or seeing an increase in, um, in, in uh, problems amongst young people. For example, in, in Australia, about one quarter of teenagers have some form of debt, which can either be informal or formal um, levels of debt, which then often uh, sort of, uh, 
you know, are a, a slide into even, even greater problems uh, later on in life. Also, we, we, we know that youth from disadvantaged backgrounds are at particularly high risk um, of uh, both, you know, debt uh, issues, but also financial exploitation. So that's really the, the setting. One important question, of course, that then arises is what can we do uh, to, to help uh, people? And one avenue of several or many is community financial education. So we can, we can improve uh, those people's knowledge by explaining to them very basic concepts uh, that, that might be helpful in uh, with managing their finances like budgeting, explaining interest, um, how debt works and so on. We can um, improve people's awareness of uh, major financial mistakes they, they can make. Uh, for example, you know, avoiding bill shock with um, phones, uh, making sure that if they do ever take on credit, for example, in the form of credit card debt, to um, repay that before the due date so they don't incur interest and, and so on. And, and then um, another area really is improving people's basic rights, for example, their consumer rights and, um, and make them aware of dispute resolution um, mechanisms. And that's really sort of the, the, um, our lift off. So we, um, we, we, we built a subject um, called street finance around that, that really um, tries to improve um, th these areas in year 10 high school students. So students who are about 15 years old. How does this um, subject usually work? It's a subject that's relatively small. We only take in 20 students who have to apply. Um, and then um, uh, in sort of, uh, you know, three stages really deliver this subject over the course of 12 weeks. In the first, in the first um, six weeks, we effectively give these students a crash course in um, both financial literacy and, and pedagogy in, a, in, in an integrated way. And during that time, our students develop three one hour lessons that they then um, later on de um, deliver in high, school, uh, in high schools. And so, you know, as I said, we, we, um, we give them a, 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 sort of some basis in financial literacy, but also teach them anything from basic pedagogical concepts, classroom management, lesson development, and, and activities design, and so on. The students then rehearse their lessons in a sort of, if you like, simulated classroom. And then um, in, in early May, usually, they go into, um, into, into high schools to deliver their lessons. So this is what this usually looks like. You know, it's, a, as I said, a small group of students. There are two academics teaching those students. So it's a highly interactive subject, lots of activities involved. Um, and then they, um, as I said, they, in, in May, usually they go off and teach um, one high school class each. Um, in, in a high school in, in Melbourne. Now this, um, this year the coronavirus ran a bit of a train through our plans as you can imagine. Not only did we have after two sort of in-person sessions um, move everything online, um, we also then encountered problems uh, down the road. So with, what did we do? Well, you know, literally within a, um, a few days we had to move the entire subject online we did that um, using Zoom, uh, but realized very quickly that Zoom is really very helpful for sort of, you know, synchronous interactive sessions, but they are not so good for other um, things. For example, uh, delivery of um, sort of more in-depth content, which we, um, which we decided to do asynchronously in, in the form of videos or um, annotated slide sets. So we've really used these sessions interactively, often using, using breakout rooms where um, small groups would work on little problems. And I, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that um, later. The sort of the other problem that then happened was that it became clear very quickly that our students weren't going to be able to um, go into high schools because of the COVID crisis. And that was a, perhaps an even bigger problem because these high, that these high school lessons, they are really um, the sort of an integral and core part of the entire subject and also the reason why most of our students really take that subject. So we, we weren't going to be able to do that. But at the same time, we became aware that there's another group of people in the university or in the population that was suddenly in great need of um, financial guidance. And they, they, um, these were university students. So we became aware through various sort of communication channels that university students um, where a lot of them were really struggling financially because a lot of them had lost casual jobs through which they financed their studies. 
And so within, you know, over a weekend, we basically decided to sort of pivot our subject from high school education um, to providing, if you like, emergency um, financial management guidance to the university student um, com community. Um, now, that um, wasn't going to be easy, but it was an opportunity, if you like, you know, on the, we had a, a group of students who were highly motivated and who already knew quite a bit about financial literacy and also had, um, had developed lessons and activities uh, to teach others. So we had, if you like, some, not assets, but resources um, that, that we could use uh, to, to help our own students and their peers. Um, at the same time, we um, um, partly, well, I, I have quite a, a close relationship with um, the Australian um, financial regulator through research and other work. So we had a sort of an open communications channel into um, the, the organization in the Australian government that's really responsible for um, community financial capabilities management and also crisis communication. So they are responsible for, if you like, the you know, finance equivalent of public health um, in, in Australia. So we kind of um, had a, a lot of um, so conversations with them in terms of what are the needs of university students in terms of financial knowledge, what are the problems they have, how could we potes um, potentially help. Uh, and we're together with them, sort of not only the identified seven topics that, um, that we thought were really sort of um, you know, points of that needed communication. We also worked with their strategic communications group um, to design sort of the messaging format um, of content and so on and so forth. At the same time, we, um, we had a lot of university resources that we could tap into. Uh, so we, um, we worked with uh, our media team, both the social media team, but also the sort of more traditional media team, in particular the digital contents team, um, to help us design, um, uh, design online resources, both text and video, that could then be sort of rolled out via a website and social media channels um, to our student community. And um, what happened here is that the, the students really started interacting with a lot of these specialists directly. So they really sort of took ownership um, of their projects in developing videos, et cetera, all of which of course had to ha happen online because the, the students couldn't meet, they couldn't go out and film. Um, so, um, so that it was a sort of complicated project, but the, as I said, the students took ownership of it and sort of allowed us in a very um, short period of time to develop um, um, uh, the content that we wanted. How was that content or is that content being delivered? Well, the university very early on in the crisis developed something called the virtual campus or a campus community, which is a website um, uh, that offers all sorts of uh, information to students and advice to students um, online. So street finance became its own section of that um, university and um, the content that our students produce um, is now available. Here is, um, for example, one of the videos um, that, that, they, that they made. So th that's sort of the main platform through which we deliver the content. At the same time, it's sort of being rolled out through social media, sometimes in an interactive way where people can ask questions through the various um, media um, platforms. Um, the project is sort of, uh, the semester is over, but the project is ongoing. That, that's one of the beauties of this kind of content. It's going to be there. We'll be able to use it throughout the second semester and maybe beyond. And it's, all, it's available not just to the sort of 50,000 or so of our own students, but also our staff uh, and um, the entire community out there, um, including high school um, children, um, other students, and, and so on. Um, I post, um, posted a link on the slides uh, or will post in the chat where you can have a look at the content and, and see what we did. Thank you. Thanks, Carsten. That was great. Uh, um, I'm going to hand over to David. Um, so just a quick introduction for David. Uh, David Byrne is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at the university here. He does empirical research in industrial organization with a focus on energy markets. 
He's also the Deputy Director of the Centre for Market Design, which is an affiliate of the Melbourne Energy Institute. And he's been an expert in antitrust cases in Australia and Canada. He received his PhD in economics from Queen's University in 2011. Uh, David's also won quite a number of teaching awards, including our own Carol Johnston Award for Excellence in Teaching at the University of Melbourne. Um, and he's won some industry awards, such as the Information Technology Project of the Year Award in Australia for the Asian Power Awards. So very pleased to be able to introduce David um, and have him present um, the next part. Angela, you're, you're okay for me to share my screen or is that? I can, I can stop and I'll allow you to share, how's that? Sure, sounds good. Okay, we're all good? Oh, sorry, I jumped to the end. Okay, so uh, thanks. And uh, I'll start from the outset, just saying that uh, I, I got into, I did my PhD so I could become a teacher, then I got into research. And then this experience in the last year was a real quick reminder of like my gate, my passion for teaching. I actually quite, it was a tough time, but I really enjoyed the challenge of trying to how to go, how to go virtual in three days and then uh, deliver for eight weeks thereafter. So Angela just came to me basically to, to reflect on a massive question. How can we engage students in a virtual environment? Um, just sharing my experience from semester one in the first semester here. So I was teaching four to 500 students, introductory econometrics. Um, and I think the big reflection I have is it's kind of like Game of Thrones. Um, now it's not like, I mean, it's probably Game of Thrones maybe amongst the students with all the different groups and families and stuff. But what I mean is, um, I, I think it, we can learn a lot from Game of Thrones in terms of how it's delivered for virtual teaching. And I think it, for me, it's been a useful frame for thinking about our role in this accelerated kind of COVID accelerated virtual teaching environment. So, so it's useful to think about what Game of Thrones does um, or did now that it's over. So first of all, it would create a major event every Sunday night. So they'd release a new show. They'd release this kind of content bomb in the ether and everybody would consume it. But it, in a virtual world, uh, it's not just about the show anymore. Um, it's about the conversation. It's the shadow of the conversation that follows the show. So that, that show creates a, a, a tale of content through media, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, right? We need to be putting ourselves in the shoes of a 20 year old when we think about these things, podcasts, YouTubes, blogs. And I think what's interesting about this kind of digital environment um, and this event based kind of delivery of content is it, it, it's thought provoking and it allows consumers, viewers, right? To take that content in when they want to take it in. It's on their time, it's on their schedules, but also how. So if I just want to watch the show, I can just watch the show. If I want to get into the fifth cousin of Daenerys Targaryen, there's probably a podcast that's going to get into that for me. So it really gives you a spectrum of how deep people want to go into the content. But what's really important is um, when I think about asynchronous or synchronous delivery of Game of Thrones content, it's not just about the show, right? We post a show, but then there's really the delivery is week to week. It's between the, sh the shows. That is the full trail of content. So I, I think we're basically like Game of Thrones. I think, I think increasingly educators and our subjects have to be thought of as engines for providing thought provoking digital content. There's events, those are things like lectures, and then there's a tale of content that's gonna try to allow students to really engage with the material. And, and so, you know, like Game of Thrones, the design and delivery, this is what I kind of was reflecting on when I was kind of transitioning my subject. It's about the when and the how. Um, with how our students engage with it. So what I basically tried to do was Game of Thronesify introductory econometrics, which just sounds dry as, as anything, um, but I gave it a crack. And so here's how I did it. Um, I just tried to treat my subject like Netflix. So, um, but, but not, but without allowing them to binge watch, right? So a key thing with Game of Thrones is it keeps a 12 week or 10 week conversation going because it releases a subject or a, a subject, a TV show every Sunday and creates that trail of content. So I tried to do the sort of the same thing. So uh, this is kind of nitty gritty, but it was trying to get at the same kind of uh, flow for content delivery and absorption with the subject. So 
I was working with really specific times, just like, just like they would at 6 PM. I was working towards releasing my content for the week on Sunday evenings. Um, that was partly informed by a lot of the research I do um, with energy companies with recruitment. Sunday evenings is an amazing time to get people's attentions uh, for recruiting into field experiments and stuff. So I work with that. So, um, so 6 PM, all my content would go up. I'd be posting the upcoming weeks, lecture videos, tutorials, assignments. And you may say that's asynchronous and it's true. I'm not immediately talking to the students when I post, but you're communicating with them through the week. It's synchronous at a weekly time scale, right? Um, so, you know, I post that, then there's a video blog of me coming up. The students called it a blog. I got a lot of strong feedback on this talking about the upcoming week. It'd be like a three or four minute video. And then I would just talk about random things in my life, how I was dealing with COVID. Uh, my kids were on one of the videos, took a couple of videos in the middle of a run, um, talked about binge watching Ozark. Like I just talked about me and, and how I was dealing with it because I think, especially in this context, but also just try to humanize the subject, but especially in a context with a crisis, it's sort of like things kind of are ticking along. So that was really kind of a positive for a lot of students. They, they would look forward to my video blog and whatever random thing I would talk about that week. From that point, every day of the week, we worked with the tutors to have always, we had a discussion board and you can really create, you know, these environments where we always had our discussion board cleared by the end of every day, every question answered every day. So it's just ensuring that in that content delivery, that, sh that one week shadow of content, there's constant turnaround on questions and feedback. And that builds momentum. The more you answer, the more questions come. And then you kind of get into this virtuous cycle, which really works. Wednesday, I would drop another content bomb around 12 noon. And, and, and so there it was just being thought provoking with real world applications. And, and this is where you can't just post everything and leave it. Like you're really, I'm working with content from that day or that week from other sources of places, Twitter, podcasts, YouTubes, wherever I can find interesting applications in this case of uses of data and econometrics to engage students with the, um, with the, uh, with the material, um, the, the White House has all kinds of interesting uses of data that was great for getting people thinking about, well, what, is, what does that number really mean? So you would drop that on Wednesday and some of the super keen students would come back to me. This is kind of about the how. They would provide me with tons of content coming back the other way on that conversation. Was, oh my God, I should, we should really know this. It's like, yes, you should really know this. And what does a stage three trial look like for testing a vaccine? We talked about it because experimentation is part of what we teach in the subject. So what does it mean statistically to say something has efficacy, what something is safe? So we got into exactly this type of stuff. And then, then so we'd have that, that would keep the content train running. And then Friday, 3 p.m., 3 to 5 was consultation hours. And that was sort of the kind of wrapping up. Um, we'd have student Q&A. So what consultation hours turned in this environment was the really keen students coming in, asking everything I missed. Um, which was great. They would miss, there were all the nuances. We'd get into it. The discussion board, if there was, there was, I always had a completely full office hour. So I never had to use the discussion board, but the discussion board was material to take on in consultations. We, I would record the consultations, post them. It turns out those are the ultimate flip classroom. They're kind of like a real time flip classroom. So the consultation videos were a big hit. Um, and you know, it creates the benefit for all 400 other students or 500 other students through the engagement and the, and the discussions I was having with students in, um, consultation hours. And then there'd be a, an end of the week post and we'd start the content cycle on Sunday again. So that was kind of how I went about it. Um, trying to create that structure and try to keep people engaged. So, yeah, so it's about the where, where and the how I think we should be thinking about ourselves as digital content producers in education but bringing our own expertise into it. So if you're somebody like Karsten, there's not many people that are gonna to go to the financial regulator and say, okay, let's connect them into the subject. It's just not gonna happen. And so that's where the real difference starts coming in is we're using our own research driven connections and networks to enrich that environment on the fly. And so I, I have parallels to that, but it's, it's exactly that type of thing that makes us, gets us away from just post everything and forget about it. It's, you know, using your expertise and your research and connections to in, in, enrich the students' environments. But yeah, I mean, I think the, the COVID experience means that really kickstarts us and gets us away from, you know, I often felt like giving physical lectures to empty lecture halls because everybody's absorbing the content virtually or not empty, but like drastically lower attendance. It felt like we were a radio station or a cable television provider 
in a world with Spotify, with podcasts, with Netflix, Hulu, like nobody listens to the radio. I'm going to listen to music, what I want to hear when I want to hear it. And uh, I want to watch what I want to watch. I don't, I don't need to wait for your ta- your schedule to take in the content. It brings you to the next question, which I'm not going to answer, but you know, do we actually need physical lectures anymore? I think the answer is yes for a very different reason, but we would need another hour uh, to get into that. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, a very different perspective. And now we're going to have yet another very different perspective coming from Maggie, um, who is a teaching specialist in accounting. Um, so Maggie joined the Department of Accounting as a teaching specialist in 2018, and she's taught introductory accounting and accounting information systems and business processes um, subjects. So some very large subjects for the faculty. She's also assisted with the rollout and continuous development and teaching of the undergraduate AIS introductory audit subject. She's keen on experimenting with approaches that can increase student engagement within the classroom and has an interest in incorporating tech in teaching. Maggie also has a focus on enhancing employability skills through embedding industry software in her teaching, such as SAP, um, and um, soft skills development through assessment, through summative and formative forms of assessment. Maggie is a regular um, in our uh, sessions with the Williams Centre. She engages with us quite a lot. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with her and a pleasure to introduce her to you today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Maggie. Um, over to you, Maggie. All right, thank you so much, thank Angela. You. Hi, everyone. Um, just um, wanted to share what we've done in an accounting subject. Um, in response to this moving to a fully online teaching environment. So a little bit of a background in the subject, um, like Angela mentioned, it's an intro audit and um, accounting information system subject. Um, with our subject, this whole idea of having a conversation um, discussion is very, very important. And that's how students are actually learning from the subject. So this whole discussion, because everything is very context-based. So having that conversation becomes very, very important. And quoting from one of um, our students, they were actually saying, having that, being able to have that conversation with peers, it's what allowed me to learn from the subject because everyone had a different idea and um, we need to share that bounce idea off each other to be able to create that learning experience. So with the move to online, that's something where we went, uh oh, how do we do this? We were prior to COVID, prior to whole, this whole issue, we were already on the move to a flipped learning um, environment. So we already have lectures that's put into videos, short snippets, bite sized video, ready to be delivered to um, the students. With that, mode of teaching, we also try to enhance the in-class experience. So we've actually lengthened, um, increased the tutorial time to encourage more of that discussion. With the move to COVID, that's what hit us quite a bit. So this slide actually showed the changes that we've made in order to allow for that. And with that, I'd also like to mention um, in the subject, I'm working closely also with one of my colleagues, Matt Daiki, who is also in this session. So. Um, several things um, that we tried to do in order to preserve that student to student interactions. So the very first thing is um, this webinar style. So this webinar style teaching is acts as a support. So there are, um, with the webinar style teaching, it's us delivering to a large class of students. So greater than 75. With a cohort of 300, we often get 100 plus to 200 attendance in a single webinar. With this particular webinar, we've designed it so that we could still show students how to apply their knowledge to a particular case, to a particular problem. But we've um, this is more of the technical aspect where they don't necessarily need to talk to each other as much. Um, with the webinar style of teaching, we found that students would then have the ability to ask questions, confirm points that they're unsure of straight away. So um, the main presenter during the webinar would go through a particular point and if students are unsure they could immediately raise their questions through the Q&A or the chat function. As such they could without having to wait say until the very end of the webinar to ask their questions they could clarify points that they're unsure of straight away. 
This enables us to make large classes interactive as well. However, I wouldn't say downside, but downside for a lack of better words is that we need at least two staff in the room. So this semester, we were still doing this because we were still teaching online. Um, our last webinar, we had an attendance of about three, 200 to 300 students. And what ends up happening was we were getting two questions every minute. Within an hour, we hit 120 questions on the Q&A. So we were struggling to answer, answer it on time as well. So we do at least need two staff to monitor this. Now, coming to that student-to-student -student engagement, another thing that we um, have done is we've um, encouraged students or made students create this online study group. So we've preserved the tutorial format that Angela previously mentioned, so a smaller classroom, and moved that onto Zoom. So we had a classroom about 20 to 25 students. And within this classroom, we've got students to form study groups of four to five each group. Now, before coming to the tutorial, they have to work in group and come up with a group answer for all the tasks that they need to do. So they need to have this discussion outside of class. The length of discussion, how long they want to discuss it, how in-depth that discussion is, that's up to them to work on. However, they need to come to class with a genuine attempt of all the problems. How they carry out this discussion, whether they want to do it through Facebook, Zoom, et cetera, that's completely up to them to do. But the result of that is students would be then coming to class prepared with this group answer and ready to share then that becomes the basis of our discussion. In a classroom of 20, we'll have four different groups who then would share each of their group ideas with each other. Anecdotal evidence from students actually said that by allowing them to, this, to do this, allowing them to do this, they've actually found friends during this period of isolation. They were managed to, um, there were groups that managed to become really close friends as a result of this, as they were spending hours and hours with each other throughout the week. And also, however, one downside of this online study group method is there is variability in the group. So there are groups that they were able to form friends that are very, very keen and found this method to be very useful. However, we've also got groups because it was randomly selected that generally are more passive. So if they're more passive, the learning might not be as enhanced. And for us as teaching staff, monitoring that engagement because it's outside of the classroom, only until they come in, then we'll know how engaged they are. But monitoring something that happens outside of classroom can be very difficult for us. And we've also found that a lot of the in-class guidance that we provide to guide discussions now needs to be formalized and put ahead of time. So we need to think ahead as to, oh, how do we guide this discussion so that students are able to do this on their own before coming to class? Another thing that we've done is we've also um, created this discussion board. So um, we've encouraged a discussion online. So the discussion board that we use is called Piazza. So rather than having discussion, we post a particular question students have to discuss. What we've actually opened this up to is to enable peer-to-peer -peer support. Us as teaching staff, we monitor these discussions. So if one discussion is going down the wrong lane, then we'll try to pull them back. But otherwise, um, students were able to support each other, um, both on questions, um, technical supports, or just general content in the subject. And anecdotal evidence from the students is in a subject of 300, doing this, having this discussion board and having this peer-to-peer -peer support actually allows them to find a cohort sense of belonging. They feel like they're in it together with the subject. And we found that to be pretty successful. That's it for me. Thank you. So I'm going to quickly just wrap up. Um, so what we learned a lot from is the diversity of, um, of things that people are putting into their classes to incorporate some engagement uh, with students. Um, and I think the accounting example is one of the standout ones for large uh, classes in terms of the peer-to-peer -peer or people starting to think about peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Um, and what you have with Carsten and, and David are two unique examples with um, really some tough subjects that we often find are quite challenging for our staff to teach uh, in terms of statistical and finance level subjects. So 
I hope you got something uh, from those two examples. So what we're trying to do as a centre is really leverage off these lessons learnt, use those as we prepared for semester two, and we're now in the middle of semester two. Um, so those insights allowed us to capitalise on existing learning that's taken place. We also developed um, two additional resources that concentrated on those areas that we wanted to focus on for improvement. So Miriam um, did wonders with this online delivery within FBE document, which became a reference guide for our academics to develop online best practice. Um, and Valerie, in collaboration with a colleague, Kim, in management and marketing, really spearheaded our transitioning traditional engagement activities to the online classroom. So two really important resources that focused on the two areas we wanted to focus on for improvement. To help people with that, we put together an evidence-based framework to outline the challenges that we had to address, some simple steps for them to action in July, uh, um, and they're still actioning in um, August, and really some key tools to enhance um, engagement. And within that framework that we shared, there were some clickable links to all of those documents to make it helpful and easy for uh, our staff to access. The website was also changed so people could go online and easily find resources that they needed to complement um, the improvement to teaching. And something else that we've introduced, um, and Miriam's really helped spearhead with the checklist, is to put together just a checklist of things that or minimum expectations that we have as a faculty that staff would need to think about to exemplify some good teaching practices and, and LMS practices. Where to next? Who knows? Um, we all we kind of feel like that. We were preparing for a dual mode and hybrid uh, teaching modes for semester two uh, with the second wave that's now gone out the window. We don't know what our student population is going to look like next year with international student travel really influencing the size of our sector. But one thing we do know is that we have this renewed rigour and commitment to teaching renewal through teaching innovation and learner engagement and achieving uh, quality learning outcomes more so than ever before. So um, thank you very much. I've realised the time um, only now, um, but if you do have any questions, we're, we're happy to, to answer those. Angela, I want to thank you and your, your colleagues, Carson, David, and Maggie. Those are some really excellent examples of ways that we can take advantage of some of the opportunities, even in a, quite a challenging time. And I'm, I'm really excited to see those opportunities um, being leveraged so well at your, at your institution. Um, I hope that you'll be happy to share with us your framework and sure. uh, allow that to be something that we can have put out on the website for the for Stephen and all his uh, group to be able to share with us. Happy to. So what I'll do is I'll share some of these resources um, through email or I'll, I'll actually put in a Dropbox file and I'm happy to share those with both of you after the session. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. I think uh, we could uh, take a question or two, Tanya, if you'd like. I, oh, I saw yeah. Kay had her hand up, I think. I think she was giving us some applause, but I'd yeah. love to have Kay also ask questions as well. Kay's one of my good colleagues at the university. <laughs> I was giving an applause. Thank you. It was very informative. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank Kay. you. Well, I'd, I'd like to add my thanks to everyone as well, uh, to Angela and all her esteemed colleagues at the University of Melbourne. This was fantastic, really thought provoking. And um, I'm impressed with how uh, you've documented so carefully your experience and use that learning to, in, in the process of um, nurturing and guiding the faculty as they learn to adapt through this process and, and cope with some really you know, challenging circumstances, but in an obviously very creative and effective manner. It's an inspiration to all uh, faculty in any discipline anywhere in the world uh, to see that. And so we're hopeful that lots of folks will um, listen to this, these presentations and um, consider it a model for themselves what they adapt to their situation uh, going forward.
um, as I was saying, we, we do have a little time for questions, but there may not be any. Um, everyone's stunned silent, uh, I imagine. And uh, so uh, with that, uh, I also do want to thank Tanya Means and her colleagues at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln who are so generous uh, in imagining this session, helping organize it and facilitating it. Uh, 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 so well, so I, we, we're grateful to the colleagueship that's across the world between institutions where we're all trying to support one another as we deal with these circumstances. Thank you all. Thank you very much.